today's talk, we will continue to discuss the topic that all things are anatta, all things are not self, because we did not finish with this the last time. In the previous talk, we examined how the six dhatus, six elements, are anatta, are not self. And we examined how the six ayatana, this, the sense media, are also not self. To reestablish the continuity and to examine this more deeply, we would like to continue looking into these things. It seems that this word or thing, datu or element, is very old and is something which human beings have known of for quite some time. And not just in India, it seems that all cultures, every civilization, wherever, has known, known of these elements, has considered the elements important. And so we see it turning up in all cultures or we could, or religions. And it's something given great importance and something which people have felt that they could receive a lot of benefit from. And so it continues to be of interest even till today, even in modern science. Now this word element appears in all over the world, but in Buddhism it is given special importance and meaning. In Buddhism we go so far as to say that everything is elements. There isn't anything which isn't merely elements. When we speak of the six elements, these are just the six basic elements, but that doesn't necessarily include everything. We just use those six as the basic examples. But in fact, everything from the lowest to the highest, including even Nibbana, is an element. Everything without exception is an element or is made up of elements. And so we can say that everything is elements. The word datu or element is close to another word, the word dhamma, which means thing. We say that all things are elements. That means that all dhammas are datus. All dhammas are elements. When we say that all things are not self, that means all dhammas are not self. And in the same way, if all dhammas are elements, and all elements are dhammas, then all elements are not self. So the meaning of elements or element, datu, is quite profound. All things are anatta. All dhammas are anatta. All datus, all elements, are anatta. And that leaves room for absolutely no exceptions. 
With this word element, we should distinguish two basic meanings, especially the English word element has the meaning of the smallest possible component. When we separate things into their parts, the smallest unit is given the name element. This is the original meaning of the English word. Where it's impossible to to separate it or break it up any further. This is the smallest div indivisible unit is the element. And that meaning is suitable for our purposes. However, there's another meaning we should be aware of, which is more literally or is the literal meaning of the word datu, the Pali word which we translate as element. <clears throat> datu is something that exists naturally, a thing that exists naturally in itself, by itself. So there are these two primary meanings of element or datu, the smallest individual, individual, indivisible unit of something and that which exists naturally in itself, by itself. Both of these meanings are important. When we talk about <coughs> the six elements, this corresponds to the first meaning, these six basic units. But when we speak in terms of the second meaning, we say everything is a datu. All things are datus. And it's impossible to count them all or list them all. Now we'd like to look at <coughs> the six elements, at how they are anatta, not self. First is the earth element. This doesn't mean that the earth element, we call it the earth element because it's seen easily in the earth. But this doesn't mean that this earth element is the earth. The earth element is the element that takes up space, the element that takes up room or space. And so we call it the earth element, and it's seen easily in the earth. The second element is the water element, not because it is water, but because it's seen most easily in liquids. This is the element of holding together, of cohesion. The element which tries to keep things together, hold them together. The third element is the fire element, which is seen most easily in fire. But it's, it's the element of combustion. Wherever there is combustion, a burning up, of things, there is transformation, change. So this element is the element of change. And then the fourth element, the wind element, is not necessarily wind, but it's the movement which is seen easily in wind, in evaporation and so on. So these are the four physical elements. Then there is the non-physical elements, the first of which is the space element, the element of voidness, which underlies or 
receives all the other elements. And then sixth is the element of consciousness, the consciousness element, which is the source of all consciousness in all living things. In all things that are conscious, that are alive, that consciousness is derived from the consciousness element. These are the six basic elements. Now all six of these elements are quite marvelous. There's something marvelous and wonderful about each of them. For this reason, people in ancient times often took them to be holy or sacred. They considered them to be so sacred that they thought there was a soul or a self in each of them and then they were named according to different gods, the earth god, the water god, and so on. So the self was was attributed to the different elements because of their marvelous properties. Whether the ancient Indians or the ancient Greeks, they considered these elements so important that they saw powers or spirits in them. If you put it in the most crude terms, they they saw these elements as being ghosts, or you could say spirits, or you could talk of gods and goddesses to the degree they talk about the earth god, the water goddess, the fire god, and so on. And they would pray to and propitiate and worship these different gods of the different elements. But what's truly interesting about these elements is that you can find all six of them within within yourself, right here in this one human being. We can find all six elements. We can see that there are these six different elements coming together. They are compounded together within this one human being. And if we examine that fact, we'll see that each one of the elements is not self, is anatta. The The people living in the forests and jungles, they worshipped all these elements as the earth god, the fire god, the consciousness god, and so on. These became gods and goddesses, and they prayed to them and worshipped them. They took... they they took these things as being even more than self. Not only were the elements taken to be seen in terms of self, like we see me and you, but they were taken that sense of self, seeing these things as self, was raised up to the highest level of self, that of being a god or a goddess. This was how the elements were understood by by primitive peoples and then they behaved towards the elements accordingly. So we, however, should learn to look at them differently, but we should understand this, this old way of looking at the elements first. So it is then that the six elements are anatta. We have 
we have completed our discussion of, of them, which brings us to the ayatana, the sense media. Because the different elements can can perform their relative functions, because this one can take up space and because this one can hold things together and because this one brings about change and this one is movement and this one is conscious. These elements compound together and we get some new things. These things we call the ayatana, the different elements compound, combine into and become the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Because these elements can combine, there arises things which can communicate, or can these sense media, which are the basis for communication, the senses, and thus arise the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Once these senses occur, then these are taken to be self, because one can see, hear, smell, and etc. These different senses or faculties are taken to be self. This is a higher order of self than when the elements are regarded as self. When the ayatana are taken to be selves, this is stronger and more, more pronounced. And so the elements combine together into the senses, the ayatana, and then the senses are taken to be atta, atta, self. It's very easy, it's incredibly easy to take the senses as being self. Once it's these inner senses, the inner senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, once they begin to function, once the eyes see a form, it's very easy to take that to be I see. When the ears hear a sound, it's very easy to take that as I hear. When the nose smells an odor, it's very easy to take that to be I smell and so on. In fact, there's just a little system of nerves and thus we, the eyes, see. There's a system of nerves concerning the ears and so the ears hear and the nerves, the part of the nervous system connected with the nose and so the nose smells. In each case, one of the ayatana performs a function. It can do this because of its part of the nervous system or its sub-system of the nervous system. But it's so easy for us to take these things to be I. I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch, I experience. To understand all this, we should examine the instincts, especially the instinct of self, the self instinct. Nature is very deep and mysterious. It's full of things that we don't know. And so nature provides us with the instincts, which is 
certain kinds of innate knowledge necessary for us to survive, things we know without having to learn. These are the instincts which enable us to survive. And central amongst the instincts we're provided with at birth is the self-instinct. It's, it's a trick that nature uses for us to cherish and protect our own lives. If there wasn't this self-instinct, we wouldn't care about ourselves enough to survive. And so we should be very appreciative of this self-instinct which nature gives us so that we could survive. If it wasn't for this, it's only it's because of this self-instinct that we are still alive today. However, this self-instinct has both benefits and and dangers, advantages and disadvantages, that it enables us to survive even till today is one of its benefits. But the disadvantage is that it's because of this self-instinct that all our problems arise. We can't just look at one side or the other, we have to see both. That because life is taken to be self, we survive. But then many problems are created for this life. If we, it's important to understand this self-instinct, to see how it is that we take the senses to be self so easily. Because of ignorance, because of not knowing better, even because of being stupid, we just can't help it. We take the external sense objects, the external ayatana, as being self. Because we, because of ignorance, we go and take forms, sounds, smells, odors, flavors, touches, and mental objects as being self. This is because this instinct of self is so powerful it, that it can trick us into not only taking our own life as being self, but seeing everything as being self. For example, if you give a, a nice, beautiful rose to a, a young child, the child will protect it and guard it just as if it was alive, considering that that, that rose is alive. Or we give a, a small child a doll, and the child will talk to and cuddle and take care of that doll just as if it were alive, as if it were a self. Or in a negative way, if a child is walking carelessly and bumps into a chair, it will turn and kick the chair or kick the wall as if the chair was some kind of enemy, some turning to a, attack it. And this happens not only in children, it happens even in adults. Have you ever seen a housewife in the kitchen who gets, she's cutting the vegetables and accidentally cuts herself and she throws down the knife in anger as if the knife was at fault. Or people will throw glass, a glass or something in anger. Because of our ignorance, 
it's very easy to take all the sense objects as being self because we don't know any better. We take them to be selves, to be souls. So the the inner ayatana, the sense organs, are the first set. And then the external ayatana, the sense objects, are the second set. When the sense organ and sense object interact, there arises a third thing, sense consciousness. There are six kinds of sense consciousness. Consciousness, there's eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness, through which we are aware of, or which we know, forms, sounds, odors, flavors, touches, and mind objects. And this is even easier to take as being atta, as being self. Once there is this consciousness of things, it's extremely easy to to consider that consciousness, that consciousness of this, consciousness of that, to be self. And so we cling to the different forms of consciousness as being me, as being mine. But what we need to examine is the fact that consciousness arises just as a reaction to the interaction between sense organ and sense object. There is no consciousness without sense organs and sense objects. It's only when the sense organs and sense objects interact that consciousness occurs. So there's no way that consciousness can be self. It depends on things which are not self. It arises momentarily and passes away. It too is not self. The fourth set is called contact. When there's the sense organ, the sense object, and sensory consciousness, when these three meet together, there occurs what we call contact, or patsa, contact. When there are these three things happening together, when these three, when sense organs, sense objects, and sensory consciousness function together, that is contact. There are the six kinds of contact. There's not just contact, there's eye contact, ear contact, nose, tongue, body, and mind contact. Now this, because of our our ignorance, our foolishness, we take to be self. We take it to be my contact or I am contact. This experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and mental experience. Sensory experience is taken to be I, to be the ego, the self, the soul. But if we look, if we study it with a clear, calm mind, we see that in fact, these are just, contact is just the functioning together of sense organs, sense object, and sense consciousness. 
that's all. It's the contact of the senses. It's not the co- contact of me, of ego, of self. So it's time to, to stop falling for this illusion, to stop getting caught or tricked by this illusion, but to see that it's not self, that the functioning together of the sense, sense organs, sense objects, and sense consciousness is just something that happens naturally. It's time to give up attaching to it as atta, as me, as ego. Next, the fifth set. When there is contact, feeling arises. Feeling or vetana is just the reaction of contact. When there is contact, there is this natural reaction, which we call feeling. It can be agreeable feeling or disagreeable feeling. Or more simply, there is positive and there is negative feelings. This is just the natural reaction when there is contact, the reaction of contact, and that's all. But because of our foolishness, because we're ignorant, that is taken to be me or mine. The feeling is taken to be me, I feel, or the feeling is taken to be mine. I feel positive, I feel negative, my feeling. We turn feeling into ego, into self, because of ignorance, when in fact it's just the product or reaction of contact. Contact is not self, and its its result, its product, is also not self. But because of ignorance, we don't see this. And so we take it to be me, to be mine. We make an ego out of feeling. This point is very important because the world makes all sorts of problems out of feeling. The world is full up with problems caused by positive and negative feelings. And all those problems can only occur because we ignorantly take feeling to be me and mine. The sixth, the fifth set then is feeling, positive and negative feelings, which are the reaction to contact. All feelings are not self. And now the, we're not finished, we have some more to go. In the sixth set, once there is feeling, then the mind performs a further function. Notice we say the mind. It's the mind that does this, not any self or soul. But when there is feeling, the next, the natural function of the mind is to perceive it or to recognize it. When there is feeling, the mind will recognize it, classify it, and regard it as being this or that. For example, Some feelings are recognized as being happy feelings, sukhavetana, and some are recognized as being painful feeling or unpleasant feeling, dukkavetana. And then the, the ones that are the lowest and most, most dangerous as this feeling comes from a woman, this feeling comes from a man. 
And so the feelings are perceived, are recognized in all kinds of different ways. This is just a natural function of the mind and nothing more. But because of our stupidity, we go and take that function, that recognition as being self. I recognize, I perceive, or this is my perception, my recognition, and, and so on. So the sixth set is sanya, perception or recognition, which is just a natural function. One should not fall into the air, one should avoid the error of taking this to be self. The seventh set is just the reaction of sanya, or the reaction to perception, recognition. It's just a natural reaction of mind that when something is perceived and recognized, then there will arise some intention of what to do with it, what to do about it. As soon as there is recognition, intention or volition occurs naturally, immediately, as how to respond to this thing that is recognized. If we don't recognize it, no, there will be no intention or volition. But as soon as it's recognized, I'm gonna, we're going to do this about it. And then this volition, this willing, is taken to be the self or the soul. I will, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. This. But in fact, Volition is just a reaction to, to perception. So it's called sanya chetana, sanya chetana. Intention to sanya, towards sanya, which is recognition, perception. That's the seventh set. Once there is volition, there occurs the eighth set. When there is the intention to do something, then there arises the want to want to do it. First there is the intention to do something in response to feeling and recognition. And then what the mind wants to do it. This is called danha, danha, want. But let us take a moment to point out something special here. Usually the word danha means desire or craving, which implies ignorance. It means an unwholesome, unskillful, even evil, definitely harmful state of mind. Danha usually is translated desire or craving, which is unwholesome and harmful. But in this case, in this series that we're speaking of, it's neutral. Here, danha just means want. The, the Pali words are, in different contexts, are used somewhat differently. So one can't cling to one, just one meaning, but has to have the meaning that's correct for the context. And in this context, danha is neutral. It's neither good nor bad, wholesome or unwholesome, positive, beneficial or harmful. 
It's just straightforward want according to the volition. It's neither wholesome, such as we would call aspiration, sankapa, which is one of the links of the Noble Eightfold Path, nor is it the low and harmful desire or craving that is the cause of all dukkha. It's, so here, tanha is just want. It's merely a reaction of the mind. When there is volition, the mind, the next step is to want according to that volition. If we are foolish, we will take this want to be self, to be I want. This is what I want. So we ought to have wisdom to see that it's merely a natural reaction of the mind. Want is anatta, not self. Now we come to the last two sets. When there is want, it's natural that the mind will think. So the ninth set is thought. Whenever there is want, the mind will think accordingly. There will be thoughts according to that want. This is just totally natural. And then once there is thought, there arises the tenth set, which is consideration, to ponder. First there is want, and then thought, and then one ponders, one analyzes. It's a critical, in investigative, pondering, consideration of things. This is thought in Pali is called vitaka, vitaka, thought. And then consideration is, call, is called vijara, vijara. These are the ninth and tenth sets. Usually people take thought to be I think. Thought is taken as self or consideration. I consider, I ponder. Don't do that anymore. Don't, don't waste your time. See that, that thought and consideration are merely reactions, natural processes and functions of this mind and nothing more. See them as anatta. There's no need to take them to be self, soul, me, or mine in any way. So these are the last two groups, thought and consideration. So this is all about the ayatana, the sense media. They are the senses themselves and all the things connected with the senses. These are all just natural processes. They're neither good nor bad, wholesome or unwholesome. They're just natural functions of the mind. There are 60 of them. There are the six sense organs the inner ayatana, the six kinds of sense objects, the six, the external ayatana. There are the six kinds of consciousness, or vijnana, the six kinds of contact, or patsa, the six kinds of feeling, or vetana, the six kinds of perception, recognition, sanya, the six kinds of intention or volition, sanya jetana, 
the six kinds of want, tanha, the six kinds of thought, vitaka, and the six kinds of pondering, vijara. Altogether there are sixty of them. Aren't these minds of ours marvelous that within them there are these sixty different functions, all of them which occur naturally without requiring any self or soul to run the show. It's just the, the way our minds are. Now it may seem that they're more complicated than a computer and there's no way that we could ever deal with, with all these 60 different functions. But in fact, we can control, we can supervise all 60 of these functions with just one thing, with sati, 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 mindfulness. With one thing, just mindfulness, we can deal with all 60 of these functions not we, the mind, the mindfulness of the mind and oversee all of these functions and then there won't be any problems. This is why we practice mindfulness with breathing, to develop the necessary mindfulness to deal with all 60 of these functions. So although 60 may seem like quite a lot, it only takes one thing to control it all. And this is the date. With mindfulness, with genuine mindfulness, we'll, there's no need to take any of these 60 as being self or soul. With mindfulness, we can live totally aware that all of these 60 things are anatta, are not self. So that finishes the second group, that of all the things related to the ayatana. <clears throat> the first group were the datus, the elements all of which are not-self. And then the second group, the senses and all the sense functions which we have seen are not-self. <coughs> this brings us to the third group, the khandas, the khandas or the five aggregates. Five aggregates are not so difficult to understand after hearing about the ayatana because the five aggregates are included within the what we've been discussing in terms of the senses. So it's not so difficult to look at the five khandas. So we'll do so in order to see that none of the aggregates is self, that there's no need to cling to any of them as being me or mine. The things which come together to make up a life, the <clears throat> components that make up a life can be distinguished into two areas, the mind and the body. And then the components that make up the mind can be distinguished into four. So there are four mental components or aggregates and one physical component or aggregate. Altogether these five components or aggregates of a human being, five things that make up a human being, 
altogether are called the five khandas, the five aggregates. The first khanda is rupa khanda, or the form aggregate. Rupa means form, or we could say body. This is the first four elements, the four physical elements of earth, water, fire, and wind. These four physical elements and the things associated with them is what makes up rupa or form. This is the first aggregate. So the earth, water, fire, and wind elements compounded together is the body. And then based on the body are all kinds of states or conditions such as femininity or masculinity, stillness or the ability to move. Um, so there, beauty and so on. So there are the four physical elements and the states or conditions which depend on them, which includes the nervous system and the senses, which are part of the nervous system, as well as the sense objects. This is all included in Rupa Khanda, or the form aggregate. All of these elements and the things based upon these elements have, are in no way a self or a soul. We need to see that Rupa Khanda form, the form aggregate, the body aggregate is not self. Okay, as we know, when there are the ayatana and they interact, there arises sense consciousness and then there is contact. And the reaction to contact is feeling or vetana. Vetana, feeling, is considered the second aggregate. It's the first of the four mental aggregates. There's the physical aggregate and then four mental. And the first of these is considered to be Vetana Khanda, the feeling aggregate. When there is the sense activity and then contact, then there is feeling. It can be satisfied feeling, dissatisfied, or we can just say positive feeling, negative feeling. But sometimes, if it's neither, the feeling is neither positive or negative, then we call it kind of indiscriminate or undeterminate feeling. Not neutral, but it's kind of in the middle where you can't say it's positive but you can't say it's negative. These are the three kinds of feeling. These occur naturally whenever there is contact. Feeling happens over and over again throughout the day. Visual feelings toward the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Whenever the first five senses interact, there's physical contact and then feeling arises. These feelings occur naturally. There's nothing about them which deserves to be taken as a self or a soul, as me or mine. The feeling aggregate is not self. 
In this case, we take contact and consider it to be part of the feeling aggregate. Now we're not talking about ten, but five. And so we hear Vedanakanda includes contact. In one day, how many contacts are there? How many visual, oral, how many are like nose, mouth, tongue, body, and mind contacts are there? And how many then kinds of feeling? How many different feelings are arising with all these contacts just in one day? See how many there are in the variety in the constant change of all the contacts and all the feeling. And in spite of that, we go and take it to be my contact, I contact, I feel, my feeling. I am happy, I am, I am painful. Over and over again, I am positive, I am negative. When in fact, all of these contacts are all the contacts and all the feelings are not self. There's not anything you can do about it as long as there is, there are these senses, there will be contact and feeling. You can't stop it, you can't live without it. As long as we're alive and there are the six senses, there will be contact and feeling. And you can't help it as long as there is feeling, there will be recognition, there will be sanya. Once there is feeling, this perception, recognition occurs naturally, automatically. We perceive things, we recognize them, classify them, according to the feeling. This, this happens, but we see it as self. Although all the perceptions and recognition are dependent upon things which are not self, and all the recognitions are not self themselves, we see them as being I, I recognize, my perception, and so on. We see them as being self. We attach to them as being self. And once there is the third aggregate of recognition, then there naturally arises the fourth aggregate, or thought. We already discussed thought, the different forms of thought. Once there is sanya khanda, the recognition aggregate, then there arises sankhara khanda, the thinking aggregate. So, and then that is taken to be self. I think, my thoughts. So now we come to the fifth aggregate, which you've already heard of. It's the consciousness aggregate, vijnana khanda. We already heard that vijnana comes in, consciousness comes in when the sense object and sense organ, the sense organ and sense object interact, and then consciousness arises. But we put consciousness at the end as the fifth aggregate. And the reason for this is because it arises so often and in so many places. It wouldn't be correct to put it at just the second position. When we, when we follow the sequence or the order, we begin with form, which includes the senses. And then consciousness arises, and there is contact and feeling. And then recognition or perception, and then conception, 
thought. These follow a natural sequence. But consciousness doesn't just go in at the beginning. When feeling arises, there is consciousness and feeling. When recognition occurs, there is consciousness and recognition. When thought occurs, there is consciousness in thought. So for this reason, we put consciousness at the end as the fifth khanda, because it's arising with everything. When every, anything occurs, there is consciousness in that. And so then, vijnana khanda, consciousness, is the fifth aggregate. Consciousness can be towards physical objects, the first five kinds of ayatana. But consciousness can also be towards mind objects, which is the sixth ayatana. And mind objects includes feelings, recognitions, and thoughts. So then because it's happening all over the place, we say, because it doesn't follow the order, it does, you can't put it anywhere specific in this order, we put Vijnana Khanda as fifth. So these are the five aggregates that make up a human life. These five things together are the human being. And each of them is not self. Together, they are not self. So these five khandas are our lives. Our lives are just these five khandas. Or we could say our lives are the 60 things connected with the senses. But 60 is quite a big number, it's hard to keep track of. So it's easier to just talk about the, the five khandas. To know yourself, to know oneself, is to know these five khandas. If you don't yet know these five khandas, then you don't know yourself. And so we need to study these five khandas in order to know what our life is, to know what's going on in our lives. So we study the five khandas to see that they're arising naturally. They're made up of the elements. They're just a coming together of natural essences. Things happen according to the law of nature. They arise, they perform some function, and they pass away. These things arise, they perform their function and pass away, and then another thing arises, functions, and passes away. There's this endless flow of change and transformation of the five khandas. This is what we call life. This is what we are. None of it is a self or a soul in any way. Those are just illusions created by our own ignorance. And then, because of, with stupidity, we go and cling to those illusions more and more. But we can, with mindfulness, we can investigate and study these five khandas to see that they're always changing, to see their instability, the insecurity of their constant concocting, and to see that they are not so, that they are anatta. When we have this understanding of the five khandas with mindfulness and wisdom, then we master our lives. We have mastered life, <clears throat> only we truly know how to live life, only when we have a thorough and complete understanding of these five khandas. 
then once we really know life, there will be no more problems in life. As long as there are the senses, the ayatana, there will be the five khandas. We take this 60 thing, the 60 items of the senses, and we condense it or summarize it into five and call it the five khandas. Life is the five khandas. There is nothing more to life or beyond the five khandas. But because of our foolishness, these five khandas are all just natural functions, natural processes, according to that occur and exist through and because of the law of nature. That's all, they're just natural. But because we are stupid, we go and take them to be me and mine. This means we are thieves, we're robbers, crooks. We go and steal these khandas and claim them to be our own. We classify them, we regard them, we claim them to be me and mine, which is to fight against nature. In fact, these things are natural, they belong to nature. But because of ignorance, we, we claim them to be me and mine. But the problem is, when the thief steals, the thief gets punished. The thief is punished when we, when we, because it's life which is the thief. When there is ignorant, life is clinging to itself as me and mine. And then the, the punishment is that the five khandas get heavy. When we latch onto these khandas as me and mine, they become a burden, which means life becomes a burden. The burden of life is created by stealing the khandas, claiming them to be me and mine. They get heavy, burdensome, all kinds of troubles are made out of the khandas, out of life. This is the punishment, the suffering, this is our big problem in life, this punishment uh, that occurs from stealing the khandas. And so the response is to, to let go, to see that all five khandas, to see that life is not self, to see the naturalness of life, and stop stealing life, stop claiming it to be me and mine. When we don't steal anything, then there is nothing heavy, then there is nothing heavy to carry. There is no burden. Life is no problem, and there is no dukkha. This right here is the benefit, the wonder, the marvelousness of anatta. The beauty of anatta is that it frees us from all problems, from all dukkha. We, we stop stealing life. Life is no longer a burden, it's free. This is the advantage of anatta. You would do well to be very interested in, in it, in not-self. Now, in India, before the Buddha's time, they knew of these five khandas. It wasn't like they didn't know about these things. They knew about the five khandas, but they only knew them in terms of being self. 
Some people said the form is self, others said feeling is self, recognition is self, thought is self, consciousness is self, and so on. So they knew the five khandhas as being self. But the Buddha appeared, when the Buddha appeared, he said, no, it's not like that. There are the five khandhas. There is life. But they're not self. That knowing the khandhas is as self, as being self, is misunderstanding. To understand the khandhas correctly is to know that Form is not self, feeling is not self, recognition is not self, thought is not self, and consciousness is not self. This is the correct understanding. When one misunderstands the khandhas and takes them to be self, they become heavy and burdensome, which creates suffering. But when they are understood correctly, there's no problem. Life is not a problem at all. There's nothing burdensome or painful about it. And so the Buddha appeared to, to teach that the five khandhas are not self, so that we can live so that the khandhas can live free of suffering without any dukkha. If you practice honest panasati successfully, then you will develop a complete and thorough understanding of these five khandhas that none of them is self. You will, you will be able to let go of any misunderstandings about the khandhas, and then there won't be any more dukkha. Now, all of you live in a scientific era. This is in India of 2,600 or 3,000 years ago. And modern science can help us a great deal in understanding that the five khandhas are not self. If we had the time, we could, we could bring up all kinds of different examples from science that show that the, that help to show that the five khandhas are not self. So since you live in a scientific era, Please study these things correctly. Study them scientifically. Study them inwardly. How these five khandhas, which is your daily life, these five khandhas are life from moment to moment. There's nothing but these five khandhas. Study them. Examine them until seeing that they are not self. If you do this, if you practice anapanasati correctly, then you will be able to say, without believing anyone else, we are the we which is not really we, or not really us. I am the I which is not really I. This completes the business of the five khandhas. So may we end today's session. And thank you for being very good listeners. Thank you. And that's all for today.